Hello, I'm Gail Casper. Thank you for having me. Up until I was 28 years old, I suffered a disease that impacts 70% of people, being stuck. Now, for some people, it's a phase. Maybe they're in a job or they're in a relationship and they just hesitate to get out of it. Or maybe they've lost their job and they're afraid to send out those resumes for fear of, of not getting the job that they want. Or maybe they're in a home and they hesitate to move and they've been delaying that move. For me, being stuck was a way of life. When I was growing up with my parents, I just wanted to please them. I wanted their approval. I was a straight-A student. I received a full four-year academic scholarship to Temple University, and I was going to be a newscaster. My father had said to me, well, don't you want to get into computers? And I said, no, Dad, I'm going to be a newscaster. So I started my first semester, and it was tough, and I thought I was going to fail. I thought I was going to fail so badly that I decided to change majors to computers. Well, that was a bad move. That didn't work for me, so I changed majors again, and then I changed majors again, and then I changed majors again. And then finally, I dropped out of college. I didn't know what to do, and that's where being stuck started for me. I moved to California, and instead of getting into television and film, which was what I loved, I ended up working in a graphics company, seven days a week, 16 hours a day. And I worked, and I worked, and I thought the more I would work, the more I'd work, the more life would figure itself out for me. But that's not what happens. You start to lose yourself. My fire, my ferociously important reason to exist had become for everyone else, not for me. So I decided to move back to Philadelphia. Well, you change your location, you're going to change your life, right? And that's not what happens. You end up losing more of yourself. I ended up in a physically abusive relationship that threatened my existence. I had officially lost me. I sat with a therapist, and she said, Gail, you got to get out. I didn't know the first thing about getting out. I was working my entire life. I lived an isolated life. I didn't have any friends. I wasn't a party girl, so I didn't know what that was. And it was overwhelming to me. That emotion was overwhelming. Like, well, what do I do? How do I do it? Other people are doing it. And that's where the idea of logic versus emotion came into play. It's just a matter of taking steps, is what I thought to myself. And when you think about it, we do that every day of our life, right? We're going to go to work. Well, we set the alarm, we get out of bed, we brush our teeth, we take a shower, we, we get dressed, we get in our car, we drive the same route to work, we get to work, two weeks later we get a paycheck. Works out pretty good, doesn't it? Until we're running late for work. Then the emotion creeps in. All of a sudden, oh my God, I'm going to be late. My boss wants to fire me. What am I going to do? I race to work. I'm ducking and hiding. I'm worried that the boss might see me coming in late. I'm talking to people the entire morning about being late. And what's the big deal? It's just a couple of minutes. It's not a big deal. Instead of going into my boss and saying, hey, I know I'm late. I've got five things to do. I'll make sure they're done before I leave today. Are we cool? That's the logic. That's the power of logic, getting ourselves back on track. The TV show, The Biggest Loser, is one of the greatest examples of that. Because here are these people, overweight, intensely overweight. They're given this program. You know, you get up, you work out, you eat right, you work out, you eat right, you work out, and you start all over again. And then a week later, you get on the scale, only to find out you've only lost a half a pound. Are you kidding me? This is a waste of time. This is never going to work for me. That's the emotion. That's the emotion creeping in that stops us from being able to move forward, that makes us turn back the other direction. A bus driver had stopped at a gas station. He forgot to put the bu bus into park. He got off the bus. It started to roll down a hill. All of a sudden, 27 kids on that bus are screaming and yelling. They're panicking. That's emotion. It stops us from moving forward except for one 11-year-old boy who ran to the front of the bus, sat in the driver's seat, took the steering wheel, turned it from oncoming traffic, and was able to make that bus stop. That's logic, the power of logic. And I needed to do the same thing with my life. I needed to stop and look at it logically. So it was like, okay, Gail, we're going to get dressed at 4.30. We're going to get out the door at 5.30. We're going to go to the restaurant, hang out for a bit. Okay, we're going to open up our computer. We're going to sign up for some classes. Okay, we're going to look at new hobbies. Like, what are logically the things that I need to do to be proactive with my life? 
what I didn't realize was that I was moving toward my fire, my ferociously important reason to exist. I was heading in that direction because I signed up for a leadership class. Now, I was a manager in a company, and I wasn't a very good manager. I focused more on the task than the people, when it's really the people that do the job. The more I learned about the people, the more I learned about my people, the more I fell in love with the idea of helping them to achieve. That was step one in moving toward my fire. Step two in moving toward my fire, I went into my boss and I said, I want to go to a seminar. And he said, that's fine, you got to pay for it. So I used my last $500 and I paid to go to that seminar. I'd never been to a motivational seminar before, but I was sitting in the audience and there was this guy on the stage and, and he was commanding the audience with his presence and he was compelling them with his words. And I looked at him and I said, I want to be you. Step two in the process in getting to my fire. Step three in getting to my fire, the risk that challenged all risks. I went into my boss and I said, I want to do a customer service speech for the company. I'll work on it on my own time, nights, weekends, not asking for more money, I want to do it. So I spent three months working on that speech, three months. Three weeks before the speech, I'm sitting at my kitchen table. I've got like 52 library books in front of me. My computer is open and I have a blank piece of paper. The emotion crept in. What am I doing? I, I can't do this. I mean, I wasn't talking about doing like a PowerPoint presentation for customer service. I was talking about commanding the audience with my presence, compelling them with my words. I was going to be Tony Robbins. And that risk was so high, it was so far above what it was I felt I was capable of doing. It was so much bigger than me that it sent me into total emotion. But I said, you know what, get back to logic, let's write. And then I went back to emotion and I was crying. And then I went back to logic and I'm writing. And then I went back to emotion and I'm crying. And then the emotion got so bad that I was in a corner, in a ball, crying my eyes out, saying, I'm going to make such a fool of myself. I can't do this. But I got back to logic. Three weeks later, I did that speech, and it went great. But the best part about that speech was I used to love to go into my boss's office and sit and listen to him talk, and he'd talk about business and the vision of the company and all these great things that I love to hear. Now I would go into my boss's office, and I was bored. I was literally bored. And it wasn't him, it was me. It was my perspective that was now different. That risk was so big that it challenged who I was. I was now a different person. That's the risk we want to take in life, to challenge who we are, to see what we're capable of achieving, and to think outside of that box. It led me to leave the company and move on to a training organization where I would sell the training programs and also have the opportunity to speak and train them. I came across a company called America's TV Job Network. I was cold calling. Logic versus emotion. You're always in the logic when you're cold calling. Step four in the process, the realization of my fire. I went into America's TV Job Network and I asked them about speaking and training opportunities and they said, you know what, no, we're not, we're not looking for that. We're a TV show and we're reformatting our show. We're looking for hosts. Well, that was my dream to be on television. I said, what about me? And they said, we're really looking for somebody with experience, which makes all the sense in the world. But I couldn't let it go. Every day I was in to see them. Every day, whether it was morning, late afternoon, I wanted to be the first person they thought about in the morning, the last person they thought about at night. I wanted that job. I was willing to do anything to get it. I sat on their doorstep for three months, three months fighting for that opportunity. And at the end of the three months, the executive producer pulled me in. And he said, I'm sorry, Gail. We need somebody with experience. We're holding auditions next week. That's the greatest trigger of emotion. That rejection, when you fought so hard for something, you feel it so deeply, that all you can do is put your head down in defeat, look up and say, OK, and then walk out. I put my head down in defeat. I looked up and said, okay. And I said, I'll see you at those auditions. 
that transition, that logic, that space that we're in in our lives where it becomes moving forward versus turning away. And I was in that spot, the logic versus the emotion. I went to those auditions. I cried all the way home. I figured I made the biggest fool. Not only did I sit on their doorstep for three months, but here I am going to the auditions. Cried all the way home. But for the next two years, for as long as that show was on the air, I was the co-host of America's TV Job Network. The power of logic versus emotion. And that same power, it led me from coaching one individual in my business to training multi-billion dollar companies, to writing 12 audio books and just finishing my latest book, to America's TV Job Network, Philly Vision, Furry Vision, writing, producing, my own late night TV show, to being called on by networks, national networks, to be an expert, to being a national pageant winner, logic versus emotion. So when we look at the 70% of people in this world, how will it impact them to get logical versus emotional? How would it impact them to be taking steps with their life, to sign up for a class or a new hobby, or to step out of their current circumstance in some way Think about this. How many of us have ever been in the spot where we say, you know what, I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to work out? You know, when you get up in the morning and you're like, oh my God, I don't feel like going to the gym. That's emotion taking over. But then you go to the gym. You get up and you go and then suddenly your day is starting and you are popping. Yeah, man, how you doing today? I'm feeling good. I went to the gym. Yeah, feeling good. Glad I went to the gym. I am so happy I went to the gym. It's that positive, upbeat feeling. It's that thing that takes the stuck out of life, which is where we want the rest of the world to be, to be at peace with themselves, to feel good about the steps that they're taking, to be logical versus emotional. This woman, Melissa Shaw, she was coming home late one night. She put the keys into her home. All of a sudden, she was abducted. Guy took the keys, threw her into the trunk of her own car. The keys started to drive. He stopped at an ATM machine, he kept driving. Suddenly, she's in the trunk and she feels the car stop. She feels the car rolling down a hill. All of a sudden, water comes up through the trunk. He had pushed it into a lake. She's screaming, help me, somebody help me, save me. She went from the emotion to the logic. I'm not gonna die today. She started to rip at the lining and pull at the cables and the cords until she found the latch that opened the trunk and saved her life. If she can save her life, we can change our lives in any way possible. It's about getting logical and taking the steps and stepping outside of our comfort zone. And when we do take those steps and we try new things, facing risk, facing fear, facing failure, facing rejection, but to keep going in that process, it's not about what we achieve. It's about getting to peace. Thank you very much. I'm Gail Casper. Thank you.